Appreciate you being out this afternoon. Turning your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look at a fairly familiar passage of Scripture this evening. Uh, maybe from a little bit of a different perspective. And so I hope that our study will be profitable to you. Uh, appreciate uh, that you are here. Uh, I, I want to begin this evening by asking you to consider uh, wh what I think is potentially the most important part about our service to God. And that is your motivation behind such. Uh, if you look at almost any endeavor, whether you want to look at occupations, look at your job and those who work around you, whether you want to look at uh, sports, a big part of our culture, uh, successful uh, sporting teams, successful individual uh, 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 achievements in regards to sport, whether you want to look at financial circumstances, whether you want to look at community kind of projects, th there is a, a direct correlation between motivation and, and performance, or, or even, I would suspect, success. People who are very passionate about what they do tend to be very productive. You, I, I saw this uh, quote again the other day. I, it's still a puzzle to me, but the, the quote is, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. I'm not sure about that, uh, but at least you won't, work won't be a drudgery to you every day of your life. I understand the concept of behind the quote, but for a lot of people, it is this love of what I'm doing, this passion for what I'm doing, some kind of a driving thing that causes uh, performance and progress and productivity. The, the other side of the coin is, if I do what I do just because I feel obligated to do it, I, I may do it, but it's going to be uh, tiresome and wearisome and frustrating. And, 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 and I'm not, my attitude about it is never going to be one that uh, uh, conveys success and joy and helps those around me. Now... You can see that in a lot of areas. We're studying in Leviticus right now uh, in, in the Old Testament. And uh, the children of Israel, when they first came out of the uh, Egyptian captivity and started in the Promised Land, they had their ups and downs, but there are times where they're very enthusiastic. Uh, after the uh, golden calf, maybe because they were glad they weren't all destroyed uh, when Moses came down off the mountain, uh, they, th there, there is a collection for the tabernacle. And... The people are just giving and giving and giving and giving, and finally the artisans send word to Moses and say, you've got to stop. We've got more than we need. They are very excited about what they are doing and passionate about it. Uh, but then there are other times where you see the system kind of set in uh, and the new wear off and uh, what in sport is called the sophomore slump happens and instead of being passionate about sacrifices, passionate about a new relationship with God, passionate about going to the promised land, it just becomes kind of ritualistic and going through the motions. And uh, that up and down kind of pattern really characterizes God's people through the Old Testament. Does that characterize you? You know... To me, this is one of the ongoing things that those of us who are serious about serving God have to stop and think about regularly. Why am I doing this? What is it that's driving me? And I think there's a lot of reasons that people uh, have a relationship with God. Uh, we can have a relationship with God just uh, out of tradition. Uh, I'm, I'm tempted to ask how many folks here were raised, uh, the, way we, the way a lot of people say it is, raised in the Church of Christ. Uh, I would say raised by Christians. And my suspicion is, knowing the audience, that probably about half at this point. Are you here doing what you're doing just because that's just what you've always done? That's the, the challenge of raising children as Christians, is helping them to find their own faith, their own passion, that, that religion for them doesn't just become tradition. And I think a reason a lot of young people leave is because they don't ever find their own faith. They just have always gone to church because that's what they do in their family. I think that people sometimes are driven by appearance. 
or maybe even appearance combined with fear. Once you become a part of a congregation, uh, you know that if you're not very active, somebody's going to call you. <laughs> I don't want to appear to be, uh, as uh, somebody mentioned this morning, I think maybe Galen mentioned something to this effect in, in, in his prayer. I don't want to be the weak link, you know. And so I, I, I certainly don't want anybody to think that I'm dragging down everybody. So I'm kind of afraid of the stigma that might come if I'm not as active as I should be. Some people, I think, are religious just because of guilt. I don't know how long every one of you has been serving the Lord. I know most of you. Do you still struggle with something or some things? Honestly? I do. Uh, and, and after years of serving God, struggling with things, that, that becomes, you know, you just keep coming back and keep coming back because you just feel guilty about failing God. And I wonder how many people that that's what drives them in their service to God. It's, it's, it's never about joy. It's, it's never about growth. It's just always about guilt. I think for some people there is an indebtedness. As you, as you become more appreciative of what God has done for you, I, I think there is a sense of debt that comes along with spiritual growth. And if you're not careful, all you see in your religious service is obligation. I'm just indebted. I just owe God so much. I think that's a wonderful motivation. And it certainly should produce faith and gratitude and other things. But, but is there not more than just, I'm indebted? For some, it's peer pressure. This goes back to the family part and to the tradition part. Or being close friends with other Christians. And I keep going because, uh, well, my, my parents are Christians, my friends are Christians, my, my kids are Christians, my spouse is a Christian. I know this person, I've known them all my life, how disappointed they would be if I, if I wasn't serving the Lord. So I get up and I go and I be a part and I sing my songs and I eat my little piece of bread and drink my cup of grape juice and I sit through the service uh, because, boy, I, I just... I can't imagine disappointing all these folks. Some folks do it for the reward. Some folks do it because they want to avoid the punishment. Why do you serve the Lord? And does your motivation produce the kind of passion that you see, for instance, in the apostles. It's always a curiosity to me why it is that people do what they do. And maybe that's just a function of my work. Maybe it's just a function of my own way of thinking. But I want you to look at this passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter 5 this evening for a few minutes, and I want you to think about motivation. And what this passage of Scripture, how it impacts me in regards to my service to God. Because I think there is something here that all of us need to really focus on when it comes to the why. Why am I doing what I am doing? Matthew chapter 5, beginning verse 3, is what we generally refer to as the Beatitudes. It's a very familiar passage of Scripture. Uh, Matthew's account from chapter 5 through 7 is what's very often referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. I do believe it is all one sermon that Jesus offered on one particular occasion. But I also think that parts of this sermon occur in other circumstances on other occasions. Luke certainly makes that uh, clear. And, and the challenge, I think, of this passage is not novelty. I, I, I've heard a lot of people say, well, Jesus was just preaching revolutionary stuff. Uh, no, he wasn't. Uh, do you realize that the idea of blessed... Blessed makarios is the Greek word, uh, is found basically in every third one of the Psalms. It's used over 50 times in the Psalms. This would be familiar language to these people. What's interesting about it to me is I don't think they're looking for it from the Messiah in regards to the things he's saying. 
You're familiar with this, with this passage of Scripture and what the demands of it are. Poverty of spirit, mourning, meekness, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, mercy, purity of heart, making peace, being persecuted because I'm righteous. I, those things are not hard to understand. They're, 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 not, uh, they're not revolutionary in regards to the law of Moses. Most of the law of Moses in in some way or another, advocated these teachings. What I think was revolutionary was that this is what the Messiah was saying in regards to what the kingdom of heaven was all about. Devin mentioned this morning, and and I think rightly so. One of the things we do need to understand if we're going to serve the Lord is that the Lord is the king and he set up a kingdom and now I am a part of it and that's where my life belongs. And these people are looking for a temporal king who's going to come in and throw off the oppression of the Romans and and lead the people in some grand military victory. And uh, military enterprises and warfare has nothing to do with poverty of spirit or mourning or meekness or hungering and thirsting after righteousness or being peacemakers. And so this was confusing. I think it's very confusing to those people. And I think sometimes it's confusing to us. Not because we don't understand what it's saying. But as uh, sometimes people are prone to say, we put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice! Be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. So they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It's then good for nothing but to be thrown at and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house." Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. I suspect when we look at the Beatitudes, we tend to focus on one of two things. We're very quick to, to, to define blessed and then move on. We want to talk about what it means to be poor in spirit or mourn or hunger and thirst after righteousness, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And those are good things to talk about. And then we want to talk about the reward part of it. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. You'll be called the sons of God. You shall see God. Uh, You shall inherit the land. Those are things that are fun to think about. I want to back up and look at this first word again. And I want to offer this really as the objective of the study. The question that we started off with is, why are you serving God? And let me propose to you that the aim of our service should be our standing before God. What should be the most important thing in my life is God's approval. What God thinks about me. How God looks at me. How God uh, understands me. What my service is in the eyes of God. And I believe that's the concept that Jesus begins with. If you look up the word makarios, the the, the Greek word for blessed, sometimes it's even translated happy. Literally the meaning is supremely blessed, fortunate, or well off. But if you look at it in its context, uh, there's a a scholar named Linsky, R.C.H. Linsky, who, who was a brilliant guy. He has some wonderful observations on the Scriptures. Very well studied man, very... Uh, conversant in the original language, uh, but, but he just had great insight. I want you to listen to the way he defines blessed, and I think, personally, this is exactly what Jesus means. He says blessed is actually the opposite of woe. It's neither a wish regarding a coming condition, 
nor description of a present condition, but a pronouncement of judgment. You know, in Matthew chapter 23, uh, as Jesus gets close to the end of his life, and you're familiar with this section where he warns the people about the, the Pharisees, uh, that they, 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 they tell you things and don't do things, and they sit in Moses' seat, and what they tell you to do, do, but don't do after what they say. And then as the passage goes along, he starts saying, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, and There are seven woes throughout that. It's it's a familiar passage on the Sunday night crowd. You know the passage. Blessed is the opposite of that. Woe is a pronouncement pronouncement by God of condemnation. As you stand in the eyes of God, you scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, this is what God thinks of you. You stand condemned. The Beatitude says, here's where you stand before God. This is what God thinks of you. This is your state in the eyes of God. And let me suggest to you, if you want to be passionate about your service, if you really want to be faithful to God, if you want to grow, if you, if you want to level out some of the ups and downs, then you're going to have to get beyond the indebtedness, you're going to have to get beyond the guilt, you're going to have to get beyond the tradition, you're going to have to get beyond the peer pressure. All those things have their place. But I tell you what's going to drive you to consistent service to God, and that is when you come to the understanding that I just want to make sure that God is happy with me. And we're not real good at that. What I think very often happens, you see this scripturally, you see it as you look around, is that God's view of me becomes subordinate to other views. For instance, what men think of me. This is something that Jesus talks about regularly. If you're there in Matthew 5, just flip over one chapter. We've already mentioned chapter 23. Jesus says this a number of times in a number of different ways throughout his, uh, throughout his ministry. He says, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds or give your alms before men to be seen by them. Otherwise you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may be seen of men, that they may have glory for men. Surely I say to you, have they, they have their reward. When you do a charitable deed, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret. Your Father who sees in secret will Himself reward you openly. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have the reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, shut your door, pray to your Father who's in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Uh, Skip down to verse 16. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance. They disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Surely I say to you, they have their reward. I'm going to tell you, folks, the temptation to pay attention to what people think is powerful. In regards to the Pharisees, it's religious temptation. It's religious pride. And and, and it manifests itself in religion because that's who the Jews esteemed. But it's not that way across the board, is it? We live in a culture that doesn't necessarily honor and respect religious people. It might. And if that's why you're serving God, so everybody in the world will see that you are a fine, upstanding man or woman who's serving the Lord... And that's your motivation? What's the difference between you and the Pharisees? But it's not only in religious matters. If you go over to Matthew, excuse me, John chapter 12, late again in Jesus' ministry, after the resurrection of Lazarus, there is the observation that is made after Jesus has conflict once again with the religious leaders that many of the priests, John tells us many of the priests, and I think this is verse 42, 42. Many of the priests believed on Jesus, but because of the religious leaders, they would not acknowledge Jesus because because what men thought was more important than anything else. And you can trace this out. You remember Herod. Herod kills John the Baptist. 
for one reason, because of what other people thought. So how much of that's driving your life? Would you be more faithful if you weren't concerned about what other people thought? Would you be more passionate if you weren't concerned about how the world's going to look at you, how the people you work with are going to look at you, how the people at school are going to look at you? Are you more concerned about what people think than you are about what God thinks? It's a powerful thing, that kind of pressure. I would also suggest that one of the obstacles to making what God thinks the motive in our life is what I think gets in the way. We all have our views about the way things ought to be done or the way things we'd like for them to be done or what God should do or how God should do things, how God should see things. We've done a wonderful job in this country in the last really especially in the last 50 years, remolding God into a being that we want Him to be. Uh, he's, he, he doesn't pass judgment on anybody. He's not a God who's particular about laws. It doesn't matter if you're married and divorced a hundred times without any regard. Uh, it, it doesn't matter if you're sexually active outside of, uh, of, of a marital relationship. It doesn't matter if you use a little... Uh, 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 <laughs> what's the word? Dirty language, how's that? I can't think of the other one. Uh, it, it doesn't matter if you do those things. All that matters is you're honest and sincere because God's a kindly old grandfather and He just kind of looks at you and smiles, shakes His head. And, and He just loves you and He's merciful and, and, and grace just covers everything. That's not the God of the Bible. But it is the God that we want. And it is a, an example of fashioning service to suit ourselves. And I tell you, the easiest thing in the world is to look around and say, that's what the world is doing. And never stop and think whether that's what I'm doing. It may not be as drastic as profanity. That, that was the word I was looking for. I knew it started with a P. It may not be as drastic as profanity or sexual... Uh, 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 Corruption. I'm having a hard time with my words tonight. Sorry, folks. But we all have our blind spots. It, it may be my responsibility to the local congregation. I, I really don't like that one another stuff. So I'll show up now and then, but don't expect too much of me when it comes to paying attention to you. Oh, I know what Galatians 6 says. I, I, I recognize Ephesians 4 talks about one another's, but... That's not the way I think it ought to be. And it's that way across the board. And how other people think and how I think very often supply, supplants what God thinks. And, and so, back to Matthew 5. It is the blessedness that we're after. I want to make sure at the end of the day, that, that I am in a condition of blessedness. Don't confuse it with happy, because if, if the word just means happy, I have a hard time understanding how I can be happy and more. <laughs> it's not an emotion here, folks. It's a standing before God. And so, God's approval is number one. Now, here's the way this connects to the rest of the passage. God's approval is based upon whether I adopt these qualities as my own. That, that's where it becomes very practical in regards to the Beatitudes. And, 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 and it's interesting to me that, if, that nearly everybody's going to go, yeah, we have to be merciful, and yeah, we, we need to hunger and thirst after righteousness, and uh, yeah, I, 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 I have to be a peacemaker, and uh, yes, I, I need to do all these things. Uh, I, I find it fascinating. Nobody ever argues that that's earning salvation, but baptism, buddy, that's earning salvation. That's always been an interesting thing to me. We're, we're all pretty much on board with regards to the Beatitudes. No, it's not earning salvation. I'll tell you what the Beatitudes are all about. They're about pleasing God. And so, here's what God wants you to do if you want to stand approved. And these are distinctive qualities. These are not like the world. 
I need to be of, of, of a beggarly spirit. We, we live in a world that is much given to pride and self-sufficiency. And I think especially as Americans, that's a big deal. I can stand on my own, don't need anybody else. It's a problem that you have in local congregations. It's part of the reason that the one and the other commandments are an issue. Because we all see ourselves as not needing anybody else. I can stand on my own two feet. I don't need you, uh, and, and so you shouldn't need me. So I'll serve the Lord my own way. I'm going to tell you, poverty of spirit, being poor in spirit, means that I understand that I am absolutely nothing without my God. No matter what my talents are, no matter how much money I have in the bank, no matter what kind of, of influence I have in my community, no matter how beautiful I am or how talented I am, I am nothing. And I tell you, if we could see the spiritual world the way we see the temporal world, and we could understand God and holiness and retribution and justice and judgment and mercy. And if we got a really good picture of all these things, we couldn't help but see how pitiful we really are as we stand before God. And there's, all of us need that from time to time. Every one of us need it. You want to be blessed? You change the way you look at yourself. I, I have to learn to mourn. That this doesn't just mean I need to be sad all the time. You remember the Peanuts character that walked around with a thunderstorm over his head all the time? That, that's, that, that's, that's not the idea. It doesn't mean that I have to be depressed and, oh, the world's horrible. In fact, we're told to rejoice. It's one of those uh, uh, kind of uh, opposite concepts you find in the Scripture that are so intriguing. I have to see where I stand because of my sin. That's what the mourning is about. And we're right back to kind of the question I asked at the beginning. Nearly every one of you shook your head yes when I asked you if you still struggle with something. There are people in this building who have been Christians for 40, 50, 60 years or more. Have you got that all down? Are you perfect every day? No. How does that make you feel about yourself? Do, do you so emphasize the grace and mercy of God that you just dismiss your failings? Or, or are you still conscious of how pitifully bad we fail before our holy God? Now, I, I do think we need to be people who have some confidence, but the confidence isn't in us, it's in our God. We have to be a people that are saddened because of our sin, who are grieved at, at who we are and who we continue to be, that look at what we have done where God had to send God to come to the earth and die as the only possible way to get us out of this fix, and that needs to drive the way that we see ourselves. As opposed to this idea of of festivity and disregard, this cavalier attitude about sin that is so commonplace in our world. Sin is ugly and devastating and horrid, and we need to see it for what it is, and it should sadden us that we're a part of it, that we live in it, and that our God has had to deal with it. You get that attitude going where it drives you, God will be pleased with you. Meekness is really the key to the aforementioned because meekness doesn't mean gentleness or weakness. It means a kind of absence of self-concern that becomes very powerful in its control. When I don't worry too much about what I want, it's pretty easy to control myself. And that's the word, meek, in the Scripture. One of the hardest words to, to, to understand, to define. But the reality is, the basis of it is, I just want God to be pleased. If God's pleased, it doesn't matter what I want or what I think or what I'd rather do. All that matters is I'm going to do what God wants. Now, I'm going to stop right here. On Sunday night, sitting here where we're all studying together, this is the easiest thing in the world to understand and think, yeah, piece of cake. It won't be a piece of cake tomorrow or the next day or the next day. 
I have to hunger and thirst for righteousness. We hunger and thirst for a lot of things in this world. We hunger and thirst for success. We hunger and thirst for money, especially in our culture. We hunger and thirst for comfort. We want everything to be easy. Uh, we hunger and thirst for recognition, uh, for uh, s- some kind of, of, uh, of esteem in the community. You know, Lumberton's still a relatively small town. It was a really small town when we moved here. And nearly most, most of my life I've lived in fairly small towns. Uh, it's not, you don't have to be around a small town very long before you figure out who wants to be the big fish. That's not who we are, folks. We, we are to be people whose ambition, whose hunger, whose passion is I want to be right. That has to, to be what I live on. And if there's any question, and, and I, I, I do think there are gray areas in the Scriptures that Christians have to deal with. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, they can be awfully hard for some people. I'm, I'm going to tell you how you deal with a gray area. You hunger and thirst for righteousness. Because if there's some doubt about it, that principle, I'm hungering and thirst for what's right, that pretty much gets you away from the gray. So, I want to stand before God. This is what's driving me. Uh, I want to be merciful. Not dominant. Not taking vengeance. Not making sure and exercising my rights. Uh, Okay, you made a mistake. Uh, let it go. It's okay. I can handle it. I can be bigger than that. We need to be people who are pure of mind, and that's hard to do in our culture because it is a polluted world. We're just inundated with it constantly. But we have to figure out how it is that I can keep my mind from vacillating between what is right and what is wrong, between what is holy and what is unholy, between what is pure and what is corrupt. And if it means turning off the TV or getting rid of your, uh, uh, your internet or whatever it is that, that you can do to isolate yourself from the garbage that goes on in this world so that you can keep your mind straight, blessed are those whose mind is pure and those who are peacemakers. I don't like this one much. Uh, I, I, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day and he said, man, I hate conflict. I wanted to say, you want to fight about that? Uh, you know. Because some people are just kind of given to, hey, well, that's, I'm going to make this thing right. And uh, if, it, if it causes some conflict, so be it. We need to make it right. God will make it right. I have to figure out how to make sure I'm making peace. And then finally... If you do all this and people abuse you for it, well, God's pleased with you then too. Now, the reason I read verses 13 through 16 is because, I I tell you folks, if we do these things, we're going to be different from the world. And it's always interesting to me, we pray about influence. We, We pray about that very regularly here, and I appreciate that. I appreciate the guys who are very conscious. Lord, help us to be good influences in this world. But but I'm going to tell you something. Praying about it doesn't get the deed done. What makes us salt and light is adopting these qualities because it's going to make us different. If all these things describe you and me, we're not going to be like everybody else in the world and we're going to be salt and we're going to be light and it's not going to be something that we have to get up every day and try to figure out how can I be salt and light. If I'm trying to, 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 to reach God's approval and that's all I'm seeking. I just want God to be pleased with me and so I'm going to do the things that He asked me to do so that I stand blessed in His sight. I'm going to be salt and I'm going to be light and all these things we focus on. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They're going to be filled. Blessed are the merciful. They'll have mercy. Uh, Blessed are the the poor in spirit. They shall see God. All, All these things. But I tell you, folks, that's the icing on the cake. 
Because we're not in this just to be a part of the kingdom, just to receive mercy, just to, to see God. We are in this to please God. And all the rest of that is just the good stuff that God grants the people that He approves of. And I'm looking forward to all that good stuff. But i tell you what I want more than anything in my life. I want to stand there on the day of judgment and hear God say, well done. You pleased me. Do you, do you, do you appreciate that's what God said to Jesus on two really important equations. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. What grander words are there than those words right there? And so I ask you as we leave this evening, what is it that's driving you? I know you're here. I appreciate you're here. You're an encouragement to me. Hopefully you're encouragement to each other. But I tell you folks, if you want to get better, if you want to keep improving, if you want to be successful, if you want to stand blessed in the eyes of God, then blessedness has to be your object. So I hope you'll think about what you're doing and why you're doing it, because I do believe that motivation is an important part of our life, and uh, we need to be motivated by the right things in our service. Thanks for your attention tonight. If you're subject to the invitation, we could help you. We invite your response.